Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, warshippers of all ages, welcome back to YouTube. My name is C Raptor, and today we are going to bring you the second half of our little learn to play series with Mogami. Tier 8 Japanese cruiser. I can't even really say heavy cruiser because you can kind of play this ship as both a heavy cruiser and a light cruiser, which coincidentally is the subject of today's video. So in the first video, we spent a lot of time, uh, we spent a little bit of time comparing and contrasting the two main batteries, and then I showed you a sample game in 203 Mogami. Today, we're going to do a little more compare and contrast of the main batteries. I'm going to correct some errors that I made in the first video, and then I'm going to show you some gameplay of 155 Mogami, okay? Um, I got to say, this making these videos has actually been really educational for me as well, because it's forced me to completely reconsider my opinion of 203 Mogami. As somebody who was... Uh, who used to play old, old school 155 Mogami back when the ship was grossly OP, you know, seven, eight years ago. I have really kind of not played it since. And I've always looked at the 203s like, nah. But now having played some 155 games, played some 203 games in the, in the effort of making this video, I've definitely changed my opinion on 203 Mogami. All right, so let's go back to the main battery. Let's talk about what the real differences are. For starters, I want to start talking something about that I should have hit in the first video and didn't, and that is turret angles, okay? Mogami's turret angles are challenging, to say the least. Somebody in the comments of the early video kind of pressed me a little bit, and I actually sat down and did a little bit of compare-contrast with her turret angles with a ship that I consider to have terrible turret angles, and that is USS Seattle, Tier 9 American Light Cruiser. Seattle's turret angles, it turns out, are actually a little better for kiting even than Mogami's, but Mogami has better turret angles kind of forward. So when you're kind of pushing into somebody and firing off the bow, Mogami is not so terrible. She can get, you know, I mean, it's not great, but it's okay. It's But, but uh, Seattle actually has better stern firing angles. What does that mean? It means that when Mogami is running away from somebody, as we've talked about, trying to kite, fire over her left or her right shoulder as she runs away, she's going to have she's gonna have to wiggle the ship a little bit. Wiggle, get all the guns online, fire, wiggle back. Because if you leave the ship angled to where all of the guns are in position all the time, you're probably showing too much of an angle to whatever your opponent is, to, to your opponent, in order to him to, for him to, to get his shells to bite and get full pins and possibly even citadels. So that's one of the things that makes playing this ship challenging is that the turret angles don't really support as well as you would like the kind of kiting play style that we'll talk about. I'll put, the, I'll put the turret angles up here and you can have a peek for yourself. But the reality is, is that it's definitely a challenge. The other thing that was pointed out to me that I completely whiffed on is that the, the, the ballistics tool that I was using to look at dispersion ellipses actually did offer me the chance to choose between which gun module I mounted on Mogami and compare those dispersion ellipses. And that is what we're going to do now because it turns out the 155 guns have a completely different dispersion calcs than the 203 guns. And that's another thing that has impacted my opinion of this ship. So let's start out by looking at the 155 configuration. I'm going to pull up the um, the graphs here. And what we've done is I've compared the 155 guns to other light cruisers, as you would expect, in this tier. Okay, so if you start off looking at his horizontal dispersion, everybody's the same. Everybody has the same horizontal dispersion value uh, here at the start. So um, this is Mogami, 155 Mogami, Cleveland, Chapayev, Edinburgh, and I've gone ahead and added Harbin. I cannot add Shimanto on this graph because the tool I'm using has not been updated to include Shimanto. So unfortunately, I cannot compare 155's uh, Mogami's dispersion ellipses to Shimanto, but based on this information, I would expect it to be almost identical. I would expect it to be identical. All the other light cruisers have the same values here. As we push further and look at the vertical dispersion curves, what do we see? Well, for starters, Mogami is that light blue line near the top. The worst in class is Chapayev, and that sort of makes sense. Chapayev has the most range of any of these cruisers. Um, and so her having the worst dispersion is a bit of a balancing tactic for that, I think. But Mogami, um, not having the most range, but having the most barrels, comes in just a hair better. The kind of uh, royal blue line and the darker green line you see there through the center, that's Edinburgh and Harbin. They are fairly comparable. Harbin actually taking the lead. Uh, actually, Harbin, actually the most accurate cruiser once you get past about seven or eight kilometers, even overtaking Cleveland, which is that orange line that starts out near the bottom. 
So Cleveland starts out at close range engagements. She is, you know, the most accurate in terms of vertical dispersion. And then as you, as you, the, the, the distance widen up, she and Edinburgh basically kind of match each other and Harbin kind of overtakes. Mogami still kind of in third or fourth place and Shapayev out all the way at the end. And then if you look at the uh, dispersion areas, the dispersion ellipses, again, up to about seven kilometers, Cleveland is the winner. Oh, at, past that point, Harbin takes over. And then Cleveland and Edinburgh kind of mirror each other. Second to last, second to worst is Mogami, and worst is still Chapayev. And I still think that's because of Chapayev's range. So let's sum up the 155 battery real briefly, okay? You have more barrels that are on the same range on a shorter reload that are less accurate and harder to keep on target because if you remember, the turrets traverse more slowly, right? The turrets on these guys, fully buffed, I believe. Do I have, I have both buffs? Yeah, fully buffed 27.2 seconds on the 180 turn. And if you remember, 203 Mogami, I believe was about 22 seconds and change. 22 and a half, almost hipper, right? 22 and a half is a hipper turret. So 203 Mogami, when you buff her out, comes out pretty solid. Unfortunately, 155 Mogami still lags in this department, okay? Now, let's do the same comparison that I tried to do earlier. We're going to compare the heavy cruiser guns to Mogami's heavy cruiser guns, which is something that I failed, I attempted to do in the first video and failed at. So let's start pulling those up here. So for starters, I'm now looking at a list. There's more heavy cruisers, right? So I've got Mogami, Hipper, Martell, Baltimore, Harlem, Albemarle, Unamalfi, and I've also gone ahead and included Talin on this list. Now, Talin is not strictly a heavy cruiser. Technically, the 180s are a little undersized, but given the, how the ship handles and the types of things you're going to be firing at and the reload she has, I'm going to go ahead and count her as a heavy cruiser just for the purposes of discussion, all right? So again, what we had been seeing, if you remember up to Miyoko, all of the main battery guns, the main, the 203 Japanese guns were the most accurate guns in the tier and again, now, now that I've got the correct curve up, you can see the same thing here. That light blue line here on the horizontal dispersion curve, that is Mogami. She has the best horizontal dispersion out to her range. There's a whole bunch of ships that kind of stack up right behind her. That light purple uh, kind of lavender line is to Lynn. And then um, that uh, kind of darkish brown, whatever line at the top, that is Harlem. So Harlem and to Lynn here are the outliers. Mogami is the best. Everybody else is identical on that same kind of line through the center. Continuing on, if we have a look at the vertical dispersion. Again, what have we been seeing? Mogami, best in class, and she remains so, right? She has a small advantage out to about, I'd say about 10 kilometers, at which point Baltimore catches up to her. And then just a hair behind in the gold is Martell and the green is Albemarle. And by the time you're out to about 14, 15 kilometers, you pretty much can't tell the difference between those ships. But at mid right, like mid range, like out to about 10 kilometers, Mogami still has an advantage. That lavender line you see that ha takes a weird turn at 10 kilometers, that is to Lynn. So that is a really weird gun performance. I've never looked at this before, but man, that re that's really wonky. That tells me that to Lynn has pretty, it's like not, not bad shell groupings up to about 10 kilometers. And then it just falls off in a hurry. And if you've played to Lynn, that, that jives, doesn't it? Right? Like that's, that's kind of what you expect. Um, the kind of purplish line you see next up, that should be hipper. Uh, yep, and then the pink line above that is Amalfi, and then all the way at the top, that kind of brown, rust-colored line, as we've been talking about, that is Harlem. Harlem remains. Harlem, because of Harlem's survivability, the heel, how hard she is to kill, and all the other things, and I guess as a weird balancing mechanic for the airstrikes, which I don't agree with, she has terrible accuracy on her guns. But again, here, you see it. What am I pointing out? I really want you to take away Mogami. The 203s are kind of back to the top of the heap where they belong. And then if we come back and look at the last, kind of the last graph we've got here, again, horizontal uh, dispersion area, dispersion ellipse size, again, Mogami, king of the heap, all the way out to her main, her, her max range. You've got um, Baltimore, Albemarle, and Martell clustered in, kind of right there behind her. Tolin is also in that pack until about 10 kilometers, and then she just spirals out of control for some reason. Um, and then um, Hipper and Amalfi kind of in that second, uh, third tier, I suppose, and then worst in tier remains uh, Harlem for most of her range. So having looked at that now, the main difference between 155 and 203 Mogami is really going to come down to gun handling, i.e. the turret traverse and accuracy. The 203s 
throw what 66 percent of the shells that the 155s throw right i'm throwing 10 shells with the 203s versus 15 shells with the 155s but the 203 shells will always be grouped more tightly they will always be more accurate you're putting fewer shells down range but you have the possibility of putting more shells on target and remember those shells hit harder 155 is perhaps a little bit more spray and pray in the sense of an you have a larger dispersion ellipse, but you're throwing more shells into it. I hesitate to use a Fuso comparison, but that's kind of where my head is at when I think about this. So Mogami, I, I'd say I'd, I'd, I'd break it down this way. In my opinion, 155 Mogami is probably better when she's firing at larger targets. If you're going to farm, you want to farm health off of battleships, 155 Mogami is probably better at it. She throws more shells. She's likely to start more fires because of it. And her dispersion ellipse but despite the fact that it's larger, you're now going to spread those shells over a wider area. You're more likely to hit a portion of the ship that isn't on fire, et cetera, et cetera. 203 Mogami is going to probably be even a little more deadly against opposing cruisers and opposing destroyers because she can put more shells where she wants them to go. She's still going to be effective against battleships, right? Because those 203s have great fire starting chances. Uh, and they still hit very well, and they they penetrate thirty two uh, thirty eight mils, I think, right out of the gate, isn't it? It's at least it's at least no, not you. Uh, let's have a quick peek, make sure I'm not giving you bad information. Is it thirty? It's forty. It's uh, wrong, Captain. So it should be like it should be. It, uh, I have to change the commander because, of course, I have to change the commander. Where is my Tone commander? Uh, whatever, you'll do fine. I shouldn't have retrained, but whatever. Anyway. Um, 34. So yeah, you, you pin, the bottom line is you pin enough, right? And then, um, so I'd say 155 is a bit more of a specialist, right? She wants to be firing at big battleships, racking up that fire damage. She's going to be really good at that. She's going to be a little less effective against destroyers than you might like, unless she's willing to push to ranges that she's going to take some big risks to get there. Um, to a three Mogami is going to be a safer ship to play. She's going to be more accurate at range. She's going to be a little more safe to hold back in the 13 to 15 kilometer range and still get shells on target when you want them to. Okay. That's kind of how I think I'd sum it up. However you want to play the ship. All right, let's do a quick sample game of 155 Mogami and I'll come back here and we'll finish talking about this ship. All right. Welcome in ladies and gentlemen to our sample game here in 155 Mogami. Now I got to prep you just a little bit. For starters, we are obviously bottom tier. There are five tier 10 ships in this match, but three of those are destroyers. And that doesn't always feel so bad when you're in a cruiser with this many guns. So the matchmaking, while not amazing, is not perhaps as bad as it could be. Now, the other thing that I have to kind of prepare you for a little bit is that this game is not going to break any damage records by a long shot. Mogami... And you kind of saw this in the 203 game, I suppose, a little bit. But certainly in this configuration, it feels like a little more. You spend more time worried about your survival and taking just the shots you can get. And the turret traverse on these guns is worse than the 203s, which means all those maneuvers you're going to make to try and preserve your HP are going to throw your aim off, are going to reduce your DPS, etc., etc. Like you, in a perfect world, Mogami gets to 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 put a bunch of battleships. Over her starboard or port, you know, stern quarter and just fire her guns merrily away while pumping torpedoes out and laughing. But it doesn't always work out that way, does it? You can't always engineer that position. Now, that's what I'm trying to do by taking this kind of aggressive push up the four line. I want to use this island as cover to go ahead and get turned and get angled away pointing my guns back into the A-cap and the expectation that this Kitakaze off my star, uh, port bow over here is going to pop up there and find somebody. And sure enough, he finds the Shimanto. Now, I'm already pre-turning my guns to look, to look astern. But if you remember, we talked about this not terribly long ago, looking at gun angles, is that the, the stern firing angles for Mogami are perhaps a little on the suboptimal side. The other problem I'm going to run into, do you see it real briefly? I'll pause just a moment. Have a look at the location of that Salem. That is about as bad as it gets for me. He's obviously going to pump, snuggle up that island, point his bow into the ACAP. So as I make this turn, I'm going to be broadsided the Salem in some fashion as soon as I am spotted. 
But with the Shimanto coming around the corner, I was thinking about trying to lead him with some Torps, but you can already see he's turning away. He's obviously thinking better of this option. So we're going to load some AP. Somebody's already slapped him. A little bit anyway. And we're going to see what we can get out of the AP with a salvo right here. Now, it's unfortunate that I don't get a lot out of that salvo. I get some full pins, eight of them to be precise. No citadels on a ship that, well, whose armor is you kind of would expect to get in some citadels, but no dice. The Awami comes in with a salvo and does do a pretty good solid amount up forward. But that's it. Now, the Salem is over there in that smoke. The smoke tells me he's got a destroyer buddy with him, so I want no part of this. Get me the hell out of here because the torpedoes have to already be on the way. Our Kitakaze, unfortunately, though, does not seem to realize this and, well, sit in smoke and pay the price. I just... I, Eight years of this game, guys, and it just you just you just never stop seeing it. It's 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 one of as a destroyer captain, every time I see it, I just kind of shake my head and go, Well, another one. Another hard lesson that someone hopefully learns for the next game. Now, our Baltimore player is already on his second radar, and at no point has he been in a position to use it effectively. So I don't know what the hell he's doing over here. Now all right, let's pause again real briefly and talk about kind of strategery. We know for we know that the the a significant portion of the enemy team is on the other side of the map. Check it out. Marceau, Holland, Bismarck, Cleveland, Montana, Oregon hanging around mid. That accounts for half the enemy team. We know there's at least one destroyer in the ACAP in front of me, backed up by the Salem and the Iwami. The max number of other ships they can have out here in front of us is probably about, well, actually it's two, right? One's dead already. Um, actually, it might only be one. And of course, the Kaga is probably lurking somewhere back, uh, back up along the B line. Lots of just lots of car car uh, carrier players like to go ahead and like A five and stuff. I'm betting the Kaga is up there. All right. So then we have in the immediate vicinity A cap. Count them: one, two, three, four, five, six ships. Even even with the K the Kitakaze dead, and the Saint Vincent is leading a charge over here towards the one line. So I am going to get on his butt and stay there, in the hope that I don't get spotted. And the Iwami doesn't get a good shot at me. Now, my assumption is whatever destroyer is up there in smoke, and I don't yet know which one it is, is going to stay there. Um, we can see now, by the, based on the rate of fire, uh, you know, we can see the, the Salem shells coming out, but you see those Lobi shells coming out in groups of five. That is 100% the Harugamo. So we know where he is. And you can also look, there's somebody up there on the top end. Uh, actually, that might be the Fletcher, the other... Anyway... Uh, or yeah, the Fletcher and the Hrugamo are around this cap in some fashion. You can just, you can look at the shells coming out and you can tell. All right. So now I'm going to do something that is perhaps overly aggressive, certainly ill-advised. I'm going to take my, the St. Vincent is backed off. I'm going to take my hydro and I'm going to push up and I'm going to mirror this Salem's position on the opposite side of this island. I don't recommend doing this. I honestly, I look back at this game and go, why was I this stupid? And yet, this is exactly what I did. Now, the Salem has reversed far enough. He doesn't know the St. Vincent is there. The St. Vincent catches wind of him, just literally I'm, I'm waiting for the Salem to back up far enough to get shells around the corner. I'm now lit. Here comes the St. Vincent salvo and just wrecks the Salem hard all the way down to 1600 HP. The Fletcher down to 5K catches a glimpse of me as he steams out of the cap. And the Iwami, you can see him now maneuvering back on the D-line. He's kind of messing around up there. All right, so now, what does that leave us with? Well, I've got the Salem locked up on Hydro. He's got nowhere to run. At no point can this guy escape. Everyone on the team has beautiful, clear visions of him and is taking full advantage of it. The Baltimore, the Albemarle, everyone getting in on the action here. And I'm actually trying to gauge these torpedoes to see if maybe I can sneak some through on this Iwami. Doesn't happen, though. The Iwami bags the Baltimore. The Baltimore bags the Salem. Bit of a bloodbath here, but we don't manage to clean out either destroyer, and we still have no board control six minutes into this game. All right, so now with the Iwami pushing back into cover and these destroyers a little exposed, I'm going to push out and try to use Mogami to do what she ought to do very well with these guns, and that is murder opposing destroyers but the, I, I took a peek at the iwami his guns were looking back for me so i have to be very very cautious here i'm going to slow down and make this turn in the hopes that he he doesn't lead me correctly 
and I'm going to take my starboard torpedoes and vomit them into that smoke. I expect this Arugamo to sit in there for a while, and so hopefully we're going to go fishing and get lucky. The Wami gets one full pin down the long axis of my boat. He's going to get the stern turrets. And I'm going to turn back in the hope that maybe, maybe we can catch a glimpse of the Harugamo, but alas, not so much. I'm going to stay lit here for a little longer than I should have. That last salvo I just took at the Iwami was, I shouldn't have, right? The Harugamo can absolutely do nasty things to me. So I should not have, I should have stayed dark because the Fletcher is spotting for him right now. I'm sort of hoping that he'll be uh, considerate enough to blunder into one of my torpedoes. They look pretty good. We know he's on that end of the smoke. But remember, these are Japanese torpedoes. They do have fairly long detection uh, detection values in the sense of they'll get spotted for a while. He does see them and manage to dodge them in some fashion. Looks like he reversed out of the smoke there and now moving back into it as it starts to, uh, starts to uh, expire. Team still working on A. Gearing had been working on B. He had to bail out. And so now the Harugamo is sort of in kind of a crappy position over here on the one line, or excuse me, on the two line. I'm going to leave him there. All he's good for right now is farming HP off the Albemarle. I'm going to try and get some shells downrange on this Prinz Eugen. The Kaga finally coming onto this side of the map to play for the first time that I can remember. There goes the Harugamo. I'm going to try and flip the guns briefly, but no, it doesn't happen. Montana strikes. We're now down two ships. Our board control continuing to slip. As we're going to try and get this Prinz Eugen off the board, he's actually going to turn out of that salvo. I'm going to ding him just a little bit. Kaga still going in on the Trump. Trump finishes up the Kaga as the Iwami now has taken a bit more of an aggressive line and is pushing down the four line to come back and defend the A-cap. Now, I got that shot from the, on the Harugamo for free. Well, not that one, but the, the stern turrets I did. And then as soon as he cuts behind the island, I got he gets nothing again. So now, I'm going to try and sneak this cap out from under the Iwami's nose. We're 300 points down. I don't even have 20,000 damage. I'm already at half health. This has not exactly been a stellar game. It's been a challenge, to say the least. I'm going to vomit these torpedoes out here on the hope and assumption, let's say, that the um, the Iwami will stumble into them. But the Kaga is not going to let me stay dark. And the Fletcher is over there smoking up the Iwami, which is really irritating, I might add. But there we catch a brief glimpse of him. Right there, I've got just the stern turrets. He's going to get them all. I'm going to take some more full pens. And bingo. Just like that, we're only one ship down. No dice on the starboard torpedoes. I'm going to turn back and try to give him... I'm sorry, on the port torpedoes. I'm going to turn back and try to give him the starboard torpedoes. Again, I'm shorting these intentionally. He lost sight of me when the planes died. And now he's in close... Basically, the Tromp is more or less suiciding. The Tromp can't, Tromp can't hope to win this fight. He's just trying to do whatever damage he can on the way out. He gets two into the Iwami there, who takes at least a decent... AP salvo from someone, not sure who exactly. And then the Trump's follow-up salvo lands all three. And so now the Sawami is in real trouble. We know he had the DCP because of the flood. Actually, no, it looks like he's flooding and healing simultaneously. And you know what that means. It means it's time for 155 Mogami to see what she can do to contribute. And sure enough, we get six and a half K out of that first salvo. He comes in with some more overpins. I'm going to pick him up right here. That's a big, big kill. All right. Pause the game real quick. We're now over the 10-minute mark. We have our first ship lead of the game. It's now 6v5, but we still have absolutely no board control. None. None whatsoever. Our implacable is in J1, which is infuriating. As slow as British planes are, he is a million miles out of the fight. But... Their last surviving destroyer, well, okay, I'd say their last. The Harugamo is way up on the sea line somewhere. We're not sure where he is. The Holland last spotted in between B and C. The A-cap should be fairly wide open. And so it's time to, uh, to do stealthy Japanese cruiser things. But the Kaga just refuses to let it go. Now, I talked about in the main Mogami video how pathetic Mogami's AA is. And I'll be honest, that is still the case. But Kaga's planes are fairly weak. This guy is going to drive into some flak. I believe. Yep, there's a, there's a flak burst. There's another flak burst. 
There's another flak burst. There's another, like he, he eats a face full of flak on the way in. And now that he's inside of two and a half kilometers, my two and my 25 millimeters start kicking in. Now the plane kills start racking up, right? Kaga is not, Kaga is not very, sorry, for some reason the game was on, uh, was on like half speed there. Kaga is, her planes are not very sturdy. And, and even Mogami's AA will do okay things to Kaga planes um, given half, given half an opportunity. And that guy did not make any attempt to really maneuver around the flak. He just came straight on in and ate all of it. 300 points down and continuing to fall farther behind. We've got to get into the, got to get into these cap circles, got to stem the bleeding. And there, the gearing Alsace and St. Vincent group in the middle doing just that. I am very, very alone on this flank. It's basically me versus the Harugamo. We just don't have any idea where that guy is. Our implacable does not seem interested in trying to find him right now. So, well, sucks to be me. I'm going to have to get up here. I, right now, I'm using the island as cover. I don't want him to know where I am on my approach in. But before I go around from out, out from behind this cover, I am going to pop my hydro because I expect him to be vomiting torpedoes back in this direction. We saw him. We saw a set go by a moment ago. I'm 100% positive there'll be more on the way if he has half a chance. But he's taking shots back towards mid. And now, hey, I got guns for that, baby. Let's go. Mosva bags the Holland. It's now 6v3. Decent little hit there on the Harugamo. He's going to slow down and smoke up right as I pull the trigger. Bad timing on my part. I'm trying. Reload. Reload. Reload, damn you. Reload, damn you. Okay. So now he's fully in smoke, but I'm going to go ahead and do um, what my good buddy Lord Zath likes to call French radar. We're going to just vomit shells in there and see what can happen. But he's moving again. He did not sit still very long. You can see the smoke starting to extend back off to the north. And so, yeah, pot shots aren't going to go anywhere. Feels bad. But with my hydro running, I at least know that I am clear of the torpedoes. As now, our little triple team in the middle, combined with the Moscow, has kind of cleaned things up a bit. And now we're down to just the Harugamo and the Kaga. I'm going to pause again. Okay, so we're at the stage of the game where it's time, time to try and clean this mess up. I need to focus on my survival. I will do far, far worse things for my team if I get myself killed. If I take stupid Kaga torpedoes for no reason, um, or if I blunder to these Arugamo torpedoes, which blessedly has not occurred. But my AA and the uh, my little fighter plane actually doing some decent work there, surprisingly. Able to pick up a decent amount of plane kills here off this Kaga, and his, his torpedo drops not really going to do much to me, and we are going to pick up the cap there. St. Vincent and Moskva into sea, and just like that, what had been a decisive cap advantage for the other team, starting to evaporate just because they no longer have the board control. And my friendly implacable finally decides to get there and spot this Arugamo. Shells down range. I only need one, and there it is. And now it's down to just the Kaga. In three minutes, we managed to basically just turn this whole game around just with patience and not throwing away our ships. Now I'm out of fighters. So I can't really do much else to dissuade these Kaga strikes. But what I can do is continue to show him bad angles. Kaga, like all dive bombers, he wants to be coming in on the bow or the stern. If I continue to show my broadside to whatever his attack vector is, the chances of him hitting me just go down a little more. Especially since, and I don't have to worry about making those turns right now because there's no one else to shoot at me. Just trying to keep my, uh, my A focus sector going. I know if I continue to press northwest... That Kaga will be in my range as I come out from behind this island. I just have to find a way to spot him. Um, he and I have about the same detection. A full stealth rig Kaga, if he's gone all in, can get under 10. Most Kaga players these days uh, don't take the concealment skill on the captain. They just take concealment module on the hull. So his detection realistically is probably more like 10 and a half, somewhere between 10 and a half and 11. But I've still got a ways to go. Lucky for me, our implacable gets some planes up there. And now it's going to be everybody in on this guy. The Alsace is going to have shots. The St. Vincent is going to have shots. We're all going to contribute to this guy's demise as we try to help clean things up here. He's going to come in for one last strike, desperate to try and get some damage, assuming that, you know, my A is the weakest A on the board. And he's right, it is, but it's still enough to keep his stuff off of me. And that's a terrible drop. He just completely missed that one. Couple of shells in the fire, we get the final kill, and there we go. So, 
As I said, with less than 46,000 damage, this is not a game in Mogami you're going to see any you know giant records in, okay? But why did I pick this one to show you? Well, mainly, mostly because I've got four kills, all right, in a bottom tier game, which I want I want to use to kind of highlight the fact that even though you're bottom tier in a 155 Mogami, you're in a light cruiser bottom tier, there are still things that you can shoot at that your guns will always be valuable, okay? Always be looking for those targets, especially with IFHE, right? Um, but also this the sense of preservation, right? You can see here 2300 base XP. I'm top of the team from a bottom tier light cruiser, a cruiser without radar. How did I do that? Well, the Kaga did me a solid, right? He kept throwing planes my way, and all of that plane damage adds up to XP. Okay, I can't control that, but again, I'll, I'll take it. Um, but mostly by prioritizing my survival. <laughs> and, and again, this is something that you'll see me talk about in all these different cruiser videos. Now, kind of final verdict here as we look over some damage. Obviously, not big damage numbers here, right? I've got... Um, I literally got one good salvo on the Iwami despite several attempts. I got maybe one or two good salvos on the Harugamo. The Fletcher, I got a couple of chip shots. I had one good salvo on the Oigan. I had maybe three good salvos on the Kaga. Lots of maneuvering for not much gain other than the fact that I'm still in the game. I'm, you know, I was able to finish off some targets with my quick reload, which is something that that um, 155 Mogami can do, right? My, my, reload, my reload down at the end of the game was about eight and a half seconds. So we're not even down to Cleveland levels yet, but you're getting close, right? At about half HP. Um, and again, we've seen what the Japanese heavies can do with the, the main battery. You can do that in this ship. I just wasn't afforded that opportunity in this matchmaking. But another reason I really wanted to show you this game is the differences I want to emphasize between 155 Mogami and 203 Mogami. The gun angles are the same, right? We pointed that out. The dispersion ellipses are different, and I think you saw that this game. I feel like I certainly did, right? Like, you can tell the shells just don't fall as accurately when you fire them all. When you get all the shells on target, they just, I mean, there's a lot of shells. You're going to hit something, but they just don't have the accuracy that the 203s do. And the more I play this ship, what's really, really rubbing me, rubbing me sideways, like sticking in my cross sideways, is the turret traverse. I didn't think it was going to be that big a deal, and I think I kind of touched on it briefly in the Mogami video, the 203 video, the, the, is that, you know, you take the turret traverse module, you take the turret traverse skill on the captain, even with the 155s, you can only get the turret traverse down to about 27 seconds on, on a 180 traverse. That feels awful. That feels awful. These turrets, I mean, you can outturn the turrets. Um, not only can you outturn the turrets, you will spend time waiting for them to catch up because you constantly have to be radically maneuvering the ship to avoid taking catastrophic damage as soon as some battleship with two brain cells to rub together sees you and is like, oh, that's a Mogami. Free damage. Let's go. Um, and I think in the end, for me, I've changed my opinion on 155 Mogami. I really do feel like that the 203 configuration is simply a better, more well-rounded ship. Now, there's nothing wrong with 155 Mogami. If you enjoy it, she's still viable, right? Uh, in the course of trying to come up with this game, I had several games that were in the 80 to 90, 100,000 damage range that didn't have quite this XP, but you can certainly use her to rack up big piles of damage. And that's something else that I want to point out about this game is that sometimes it isn't about the big pile of damage, right? On four, less than 46,000 damage, I have 2,300 XP. And I got there by prioritizing my survival, shooting at the right things at the right time, staying dark at, at the right time, and in fairness, taking some risks. Maybe not stupid risks, but I, I, would, I would argue that you can't have really, really good games of warships without at least some risk. Anyway, guys, let's head back and we'll do a little bit of outro. All right, guys, there we go. That's our final final word there on Mogami. We've now looked at both gun turrets, uh, both gun configurations kind of in depth. Hopefully that helps you make a decision on which way you prefer to play the ship. I don't believe there's a wrong way. I believe there's only the way that you prefer that suits you best. Whatever that is, Take that ship and take that ship out. Go enjoy it. Go grind some XP. Go burn down some big dumb battleships. And I will catch you guys on the high seas. Wash your hands. Be safe. Take care.